Hello, this is Angela with Parkers Permaculture. Today I want to talk about wildlife in our gardens and our farms. And I want to phrase it in a way that I think will help us better understand what I'm getting at and have more effective permaculture design. The question is, how do we farm wildlife on our property? That may seem like a, a little bit weird of a way to think about it. In permaculture, we have 12 design principles, and one of those, number six, is obtain a yield. Permaculture principle, obtain a yield. If we're going to put energy into the system, if we're gonna put effort into it, we need to obtain a yield for the work that we do, for the price that we pay. How are wildlife on our property providing a yield for us if we are farming them, if we are putting into our system in the hopes of getting more wildlife out, what is the yield that wildlife is providing? Now, in a small garden, it may be something like pollination. Having more native pollinators, they are doing the work of pollinating our crops and we are seeing an increased yield in our uh, food production. It may be a yield of pest reduction in our garden. When we have more native wildlife, they can help keep our pests of our crops in check, right? Balance out our system. Wildlife can also provide fertilization of our garden through their manure. Creatures like moles can aerate the soil for us. In a large garden or farm, you're looking at having wildlife as a source of food. They in themselves can be a harvest. Maybe it's something like deer. Maybe it's something like, um, you know, boar on your property. Maybe it is, you know, grouse or pheasant or turkeys or something like that. That can produce an actual yield of food for the table, either for you or for market. They can also provide all of those services that happen in a smaller garden and in addition provide disturbance on a greater scale. A herd of elk through your property does a great job of disturbance and we know that disturbance can help increase diversity and um, help our plants thrive. You can have wildlife that are free planting for you, either through their manure, right? Dispersing seeds in your woodland on your large zone five, if you have it, or through their fur being that mechanism of dispersal and on their own being a little Johnny Appleseed and planting for you without any effort on your part. So there are many yields that we can get when we increase wildlife on our property. I think for me, one of the biggest ones that I wish that had not been damaged by the notion of, of modern industrial agriculture is that when we increase predators on our property, when we increase the kinds of animals that eat pests and that eat other animals, we are bringing our system into balance. Predators are not a negative. I know for me, I try very hard to encourage hawks because they keep rodent pressure low in my garden. We've developed a really negative association with predators in, in relation to farm life. And I think if we check that, if we think of farming wildlife, including farming predators, we can help bring our systems to a higher level of abundance. So let's look at some of the ways that we can farm the wildlife in our small gardens, in our large farms, in our whole community. First one let's tackle is water. What does water provision look like? Well, it can be as simple as putting out a bowl with pebbles in it to provide water for our native pollinators so they have somewhere to get a drink. It can be putting out a bird bath. It can be having a little uh, pond or stream with a little recirculating pump in your backyard. On a larger scale, it can be something like doing earthworks and putting in a actual pond for migratory waterfowl, for all the kinds of wonderful diverse amphibians and fish and invertebrates that move in once you have a pond. It could be something like stream restoration and maintenance. On a large scale farm, it could be something like encouraging beavers. And when beavers make changes to your property, that increases the amount of wetland that you have, being at peace with that and realizing that may be a benefit to your system overall. So after we make sure that we provide for water, what about food provision? Well, on a small scale, it could be something like putting out suet blocks, um, putting out bird feed. It could be something a little bit more where you are growing the plants that produce the feed letting thistles proliferate on your property so that those goldfinches will come in and feast on them. It means that we are planting flowers that bloom 
in a sequence all the way from early in the season. Here I can have blooms in February, like crocus and rosemary, all the way into November, so that I'm providing the whole year's worth of flowers and bloom for wildlife so that they have forage. Not only am I looking for sequential blooms throughout the year, not only am I looking to plant expressly forage crops and to also put out intentional offerings of food for wildlife, I also plan on 20% of my food crops that I grow being freely taken by wildlife, freely consumed by wildlife. I accept that, that's part of my system and it doesn't bother me. And it reduces, it alleviates the tension between myself and wildlife when I know that 20% of my crop is an offering to them. I don't feel that we are in competition in that way. It helps me see wildlife in a positive light and for what they truly can be in my garden. On a larger scale, we can think about things like dedicating part of your hayfield to a pollinator meadow, or not even the hayfield itself, but think about the, the edges. I just had a blog post about edges. Think about utilizing the edges and how you can grow um, forage for our native wildlife. You can create those swaths that have those food crops, that have those flowers. Another good one is think about chop and dropping your prunings and leaving them on the ground. Browsers coming through, love that kind of stuff. Perhaps we're looking at bunnies that want to come and eat those fresh prunings, apple prunings you've put on the ground. When you chop and drop, you take some of that high canopy forage and you mimic what like a, a, a weather disturbance would do in terms of breaking limbs, dropping that on the ground and pr providing food for those browsers. So what about habitat? What does that look like? Well, you can think about planting trees and shrubs in a small scale garden that provide shelter from urban predators like cats, that provide spaces for nesting, that provide nesting materials. Think about creating shady spots where our native wildlife have a chance to escape the sun. Everybody needs sun cover in the summer. What about adding birdhouses, bat houses, bee boxes around your garden? Think about if you have a sandy patch in your yard, don't plant grass there, leave it open for solitary ground nesting bees. Think about leaving brush piles for snakes. On a larger scale farm, let's think about leaving those snag trees. Think about leaving those dead standing trees, those fallen dead trees. They create so much potential for habitat. The standing ones for our cavity nesting birds, for bees, we're creating habitat for them. The fallen trees create all kinds of habitat for all kinds of invertebrates, all kinds of creatures that nest in them, that take shelter in them, that feed on them, that feed on the fungi that feed on fallen logs. Consider in permaculture that we have five zones of activity. The zone farthest from the house is zone five. When you have a larger property, you have so much more potential to do zone five on your own property. Zone five is complete wilderness. It's an area that you dedicate and say, again, I'm offering this space to wildlife. I am not going to cultivate it. I'm not going to manage it. I know that it is important to create those corridors for wildlife in my zone five. When you're planting out that woodlot, when you are working to restore a habitat that has been depleted and create a zone five, think about adding nut trees. Nuts are such an important food source for so many, temperate especially, temperate sources of wildlife. So I do want to remind you, if you are in a larger area and you were working to establish and remediate and heal a zone five, that when you have those young trees that you may have to put in, that they will need shelter because that is wildlife. So when your zone five may not initially look 100% wild, it may need some level of, a man of management to get established, but that's okay. Because there is one thing in having a zone five that is totally wild, and there is another thing of having the regenerative process of establishing a zone five, of healing an area enough that a zone five could even be created and maintained by nature herself. So I hope this was helpful. When you think about your permaculture garden, be it an urban garden, be it a sprawling farm in the country. How can you farm wildlife? What are the benefits that wildlife can bring to you and your system? What are the yields in terms of food, in terms of pollination, in terms of pest reduction, and in terms of spreading seed, spreading fertility, and increasing diversity on your permaculture site? 
Thank you for watching. Please check out my Patreon down below. Please click like and subscribe. That is such an important way that you can help support the work of this channel. I'll be back soon. Thanks.